Good morning all um, and welcome to the Carrot Crop Agronomy webinar. Uh, my name is Rebecca Stilton and I'm one of the product managers uh, within Syngenta um, and my responsibilities are with everything pretty much veg-wise um, and also our insecticide portfolio. So this morning you'll hear from myself. Um, I'll give you a bit of a, a quick product update. Um, then I'll hand over to Michael Tate he will take us through a fungicide update um, for carrots, um, and then we'll finish off with um, Max Newbert, who will give us some insecticide and sustainability information. So just a few um, housekeeping. So you may have noticed that we are recording this webinar, um, and this webinar will be um, put onto our YouTube um, channel are made available for people um, and we would request that you refrain from recording it in any other way because it will be fully available on YouTube. We thoroughly um, encourage questions um, but we would ask that you use the Q&A function uh, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. If it's not already visible, if you hover your mouse towards the, the bottom of the screen you should see a bar come up um, and you'll see this Q&A box. So if you type your questions in there, um, and then I'll facilitate answering those um, with um, myself and the, the other two presenters at the end of the, the presentations. You will receive an email tomorrow, um, which will give you the option to claim basis and DeRoso points, if that's applicable to yourself. Um, and there will also be a link to a small feedback um, questionnaire. It's only half a dozen or so questions that we'd really appreciate if you could complete that because that helps us um, shape meetings going forwards. So without further ado, I'll jump into the, um, the product and, and regulatory update. So just uh, an FYI and a few products that I've got coming through to the veg portfolio. Um, we have a product called Arondis Plus, um, which we're co-packing with Amistar, um, and that's going to be available for sales this year. Unfortunately, not in carrots. Um, at the minute, we're looking at bringing this into um, onions and lettuce. So if you have any interest in those areas, then this is available for sale this year. We're still awaiting the way to registrations for Maxim 4 ACFS, which is a flu dioxinol based seed treatment. Um, we're hoping that we finally get the approval through for this this year, but we've been promised it by CRD for quite a while now. We do have um, a new fungicide, Adepidin, which is an, an STHI based fungicide that's um, undergoing registration at the moment, which we'll be introducing initially into brassica and carrot crops. Um, which Michael will give you a couple of slides on shortly, that we're hoping to have registration for that circa. Um, actually, that's wrong on there. That should be 2022. We've managed to improve it, so that's quicker um, than I've indicated on there. And we've also got a, um, a bacillus-based product, Tegro, that we've had registration for for a little while now um, that's in predominantly um, vines and some glasshouse crops. Um, that we're investigating its use into to outdoor crops now. So there's potential for EMU opportunities with that. Just a quick couple of words on some regulatory um, problems, as I'm sure, well, I hope you're all acutely aware um, that there's some changes coming up with metal axle C treatment. Um, so when the AI was renewed in Europe last year, um, it was deemed that the seed treatments would only be able to be used in glasshouse greenhouse, um, which is permanent protection with full enclosure from the 1st of June this year. Um, at the moment, this deadline still stands um, and we are trying to work with CRD as fast as they will allow to try and um, see what our options are here. Um, but at the minute, the date of the 1st of June for greenhouse use only stands. But if you've got any questions on that, then please put them in the Q&A box um, and we'll address them later. For information, there's no change to the folio uses of SL567A. Um, however, it is undergoing re-registration in GB at the moment, further to the active ingredient being renewed in, within Europe. Mancozeb, um, just a couple of words on Mancozeb. This isn't our active ingredient, um, but we do have uh, products where it's used um, in mixture, Fubil Gold, for example. So you may be aware that um, 
the CRD HSE decided not to enforce the regulation um, that Europe had that came in on the 4th of January. Um, and they've actually extended the active ingredient Mancazep for three years. So the, um, the expiry of that active ingredient is now the 31st of January 2024. To caveat this, um, HSC, CRD have retained the right to actually review that active in substance um, earlier. So although the, the end of the deadline is, is that January 2024 at the minute, they do reserve the right to, um, to change that to an earlier date. Just a quick word on what's happening um, with active substance renewals and product renewals now we've left Europe. Um, so as you're probably aware that within Great Britain, GB, we now take responsibility for our own regulatory decisions, um, which basically means that the CRD are operating on their own. They don't have to wait for REFSA or SCOPAF um, or any of those committees to make decisions. Um, they can make them on their own um, alongside EPCA. What they're doing at the moment to buy themselves a bit of time um, because they're, they're very much backlogged at the minute is that any active substance that expires within the next three year period, they are giving that a three year extension. So no matter what date within the next three year period it expires, um, they will extend it for, for a further three years just to buy themselves a little bit more time. But if you cast your mind back to what I've just said about Mancazab, even though they will extend it for three years, they will still reserve the right to, to call it in earlier um, if they see fit. Something to be mindful of um, that's is also a quirk of us leaving Europe is um, the free movement of seed post-Brexit. See, until, well, previously we've been able to move treated seed freely between countries. Um, that is going to come to a stop. So we have until the 31st of December 2023 to continue as we are with free movement seed. However, after this date, if you wish to bring a seed into the country um, with a seed treatment on it, then that seed treatment has to have a registration within GB, not only for the, um, for the product, but also for the crop that you're bringing it on. So that's something that people need to be mindful of, especially with these minor crops. Um, where there may not be um, registrations, et cetera, in place for those. So as I said, if you have any questions, please put them into the, um, the Q&A box. Um, but without further ado, I will ask Michael to um, share his presentation and he'll give you a, a fungicide update. Well, um, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the meeting. Uh, I'm Michael Tate. I'm the um, technical manager looking after potato products and veg, and I took over that veg area relatively recently. Uh, I'm going to talk to you this morning about three topics, a bit of a, an update on our seed treatment Maxim 480. I will then say a bit about our new veg product, Adepidin, um, that Rebecca mentioned during her introduction period. And finally, a short uh, summary on a product that we're really generally just starting work on, but we hope to move quite quickly out into the field, which is a bacillus called a TA grow. So those are the three things for this morning. Um, so first of all, let's have a quick look and reminder. That's just about moving the screen. Uh, about Maxim 480. Now Maxim 480 has been around for a few years. Um, it's widely used as a seed treatment on veg crops. Um, we have in the UK essentially approvals in carrot, also cabbage or brassicas um, and bulb onions as well. So it's quite widely used and as Rebecca mentioned we are looking to get that extended and we have so-called wave two crops currently with um, CRD at the moment, we're waiting for approval on that and uh, we'll hopefully get that during the year. So at the moment, as far as uh, the carrots crop is concerned, uh, we have one rate of use, which is 100 mils of product per 100 kilos of seed. This just gives you a bit of an overview on the current state of the label. So we've got those on-label approvals in onions, 
cabbage, spinach, and carrot. And then there's a number of emus which help uh, growers in some of the other crops. And we are trying to get uh, lettuce and a few other um, crops added in the so-called wave two submission. Now, fludioxnil has been around for a number of years. It's one of our most successful products. It's been very widely used as a seed treatment. Uh, it has great activity on a number of really important pathogens, um, including fusariums, uh, alternaria, and a number of others. Essentially, the product works by disrupting the production of energy within the fungus. Uh, and this disruption of energy production within the fungus means that um, you get quick inhibition of the ability to take up water. Uh, it loses its ability to control its uh, transport mechanism across cell membranes very quickly and indeed cell wall, cell wall synthesis. And, and that's important because uh, that means that when the fungal disease is trying to produce a germ tube and develop and attack the plant, it's very quickly inhibited from doing so. And therefore it sort of prevents early penetration of the fungus. Generally speaking, uh, fludioxnil is able to enter seed coats. Uh, it can control some seed borne diseases within uh, the kernel, although its main activity is more on surface diseases. But one of the really nice features about fludioxnil is it has the ability to spread quite well across the um, seed surface onto developing uh, roots and onto the coleoptile as well. And that helps it to give not only control of seed borne diseases, but also some activity against soil borne pathogens. So, for example, Looking, you look at the international activity of fludioxnil in carrots, we know we have Alternaria dorkai, Alternaria radicina on um, UK label, but in addition, worldwide, we know there is activity against Rhizoctonia solani, which is uh, primarily soil borne rather than seed borne. The two main diseases we're interested in here are leaf blight, Alternaria dorkai, uh, very common, um, seed borne primarily quickly can create epidemics which do a lot of damage to the plant, very strongly favoured by um, warm and wet conditions and periods of prolonged leaf wetness. The fungus is, I say, mainly seed borne, but it can survive for short periods in um, soil residue or crop residues within the soil. It causes yield loss primarily by destroying foliage, infected foliage dies, and also by creating difficulties with being able to lift the crop at the end of the year. The other form of Alternaria we see is Alternaria radicina. And this is uh, slightly different, but it causes mainly problems with storage rots. It's more persistent in soils than um, Dorkai, um, and it infects a sort of a wider range of crops. Generally, foliar symptoms from radicina are not as severe as those seen by Dorkai. But I guess the most important area that it causes an issue with is um, storage of rots in stored carrots and also reduction of seed quality. Now, over the years, we've developed um, some data against these pathogens in carrots. And this is some data courtesy of my colleagues in the Netherlands, where they had a comparison with Maxim and Iprodione. And on the uh, left hand side, you can see in the untreated, you've got quite a high percentage of um, infection in the seedlings, whereas with both uh, Maxim and Iprodione, you've got a significant reduction in the proportion of infected seedlings. So it is good at helping to get the crops established and off to a good start early in the year. Just one chart here looking at Rhizoctonia solani. Now on the left hand side, you've got um, an, an, a non-inoculated untreated and you can see there quite a high proportion of plants have established. But then when you look at the next bar, the very low bar, you can see the check where it's been inoculated. The Rhizoctonia has killed a lot of the plants and very few have managed to establish. And the Maxim is able to provide a pretty good protection against Rhizoctonia solani in carrot. So that's just sort of useful background information. Now, crop safety, my colleagues in the Netherlands have done quite a lot of work on crop safety. They tend to um, sell a combination of Maxim with Apron. We, of course, tend to use uh, the metal axle primarily in the form of SL567 for cavity spot control. So that's less common here. 
But this data set shows that um, over quite a number of trials, almost invariably, you're getting better establishment from using um, a maxim with April in this case, but certainly you get the same result with just the, the maxim. And on average, you can see that you're getting more plants compared with the untreated. So again, it's nice, safe material, giving good crop establishment uh, in carrots. So just to quickly sort of move on to my second topic, and that's just to give you a, an update on where we are with adepidin. Now, adepidin is a very interesting material. It's an SDHI, a new SDHI, and we are developing a specific formulation for use in uh, veg crops. And we have two sort of main target areas. Uh, the first one being brassicas, where to be frank, we are more advanced in terms of knowledge um, and, and expertise than we are with carrots. But within the carrot crop, we're looking to control two diseases, the alternaria species and also powdery mildew. My predecessor, um, Simon Jackson, um, is the last person to have set up a trial and run a trial in carrots with our new product. Uh, just here, you've got the treatment list that he used. And you can see here, he's uh, looked at a number of different treatments through the season. But on line seven, you've got a complete program of our new adepidin based material all the way through the year. Now that is not the way in practice that it would actually be used. And line nine gives you a much better idea of how in practice uh, we would be likely to recommend the use of um, our new product in the carrot crop. So in alternation and probably including a switch at some point. In that year, they didn't get any disease with alternaria but they did get some quite nice results on powdery mildew. And you can see in this that most of the products have worked quite well. This coded product didn't work, but to be frank, we didn't expect it would have activity against powdery mildew. Uh, and the powdery mildew that turned up in the trial was, was a bit of a surprise. But you can see here that the new adepidin based product has worked quite well. And in this combination with Amistar Top and also with Switch in a program, it's given a really superb result. So this is a kind of work in progress, planning to do some more um, trial work during the coming season. And hopefully by this time next year, we will have some uh, alternate area results to show you from the UK. I think I've covered most of that. I say our, our, our first sort of crop target will be in the brassicas and carrots following on from that. Just to say a few words about Tiagro. And uh, Tiagro is a um, bacillus uh, material. And like many companies, we're increasingly interested in finding biologically active uh, materials like this, bacillus, fungi, whatever, that uh, can help in crop protection and can offer alternatives to um, the synthetic chemistry that we've benefited so much from uh, in the last sort of 40 years. As Rebecca mentioned, we currently have a relatively limited range of approvals for this, but we have now started work um, in other areas. And for example, this year, we've had a look-see um, on cavity spot control, but unfortunately that data is not yet ready. It's still in the ground. So I can't report on that at this time. Just thought it would be useful to again, highlight the crops where the product is currently approved in the UK. Um, and where, as I say, we are hoping to go out into a number of other vegetable crops in the near future, assuming that the trials that we carry out are successful. And similar work is actually being done at the time, at this time in um, the Netherlands and other close continental countries. Just a few words about the mode of action to give you some idea of how this is working. This is a generalized view on the mode of action and not specific to carrot. It may be that in carrot crop, some of these modes of action are more important than others. But just to sort of summarize, when you put the Tiagro into a tank, it then um, spores then find themselves in an environment, they multiply up, and they're then applied in a spray solution to the um, surface that you're trying to protect. And the way that this works is threefold. Uh, one of these is through competition. Um, the bacillus multiplies on the leaf surface. In this case, it's the example is um, a grape leaf, 
and basically it denies space to the pathogenic uh, fungi that are trying to attack the leaf. Basically, it takes up space on the leaf, so there is no room for the fungus to become established. So that's one way that we know that it works. The second way is through release of metabolites, which are toxic to the um, attacking pathogen. So on the left-hand side there, you can see three different diseases really becoming rampant on that uh, agar plate. Whereas on the right-hand side, we've got um, a stripe or a Y shape um, of uh, Tiagro that has been put on there. And basically it's then producing metabolites which are inhibiting the growth of those fungi and constraining how much they can develop. So that's the second way that it works. And the third way that it works is by induction of natural resistance. And here they've seen in tomato that you can get following application, you can get overexpression of certain proteins and these proteins help uh, in biotic and abiotic resistance to disease and, uh, and problems in the plant. So those are the three kind of known mechanisms, whether they're all equally applicable to carrot, we need to find out, but uh, certainly an interesting material to be working on and we hope in the next season or so to be able to report some progress here or possibly in other crops as well uh, and sort of keep you posted on that. Just a final point here that it is recognized this uh, third mode of action that I've mentioned here as being able to induce uh, plant, host plant defense or host plant resistance to pathogen attack it is recognized within FRAC guidelines. So that's a useful, potentially useful addition to synthetic chemistry in the future. So I've now given you a quick update on Maxim, spoken a bit about um, our new adepidin product and said, given you a sort of a heads up on TA Grow. I'd now like to pass on to my colleague, uh, Dr. Max Newbert, who's gonna to talk to you a bit about insecticides and also about sustainability and what we're doing in that area. Thank you very much, Michael. Good morning all, and yes, as uh, Michael said, I'm Max Newbert. So within Syngenta, I'm the technical manager for insecticides across all crops. As such, today I'll give an update um, around our insecticide portfolio, obviously with a, a focus on carrots. So just before I begin, um, I thought I'd do a bit like what Rebecca did with the fungicide element, but do a regulatory update. And there's a few things to be aware of coming up. Um, the first of all is Lambda Cyhalothrin is currently undergoing re-registration. Now, the outcome of this will affect all products um, that have lambda cyhalothrin, not just hallmarks. So this will be across the board because it is the AI. Um, and the anticipated outcome is that we're going to have a reduction in crops, a reduction in rates and reduction in number of applications that can occur for what's currently on the label. Now, for carrots, parsnips, etc., we, we believe that they will still be on the label, um, but the reduction of rates and uh, applications is likely to occur for the carrot crops. The other area that's um, had some developments is the force ST. Uh, so Teflu from itself went through active renewal um, in 2019, got approved. Uh, and we don't, obviously, that will then go through um, renewal again, but around 2024 uh, with product registrations changing in 2027 potentially. So that's, we've got a couple of years of uh, teflufrin itself being re-registered. But what has happened uh, with that is the uh, map numbers and the emus associated with force. Um, there's uh, some issues due to the fact that force ST is registered for sugar beet and the emus are running off that. Uh, so when the map number changed and we had to get renewal of those emus, um, we reversed back to the old number for this year. So in 2020, we went back to the old map number, produced enough uh, that map number to sell for the seed trade to um, have uh, enough for this year, which they can apply to seed and that will be on stock to the end of 2021. Uh, and those treated seeds can be used obviously this year and into uh, 2022. However, there'll be limited seed going into 2022 with the EMU use due to the fact of applications only for this year and then obviously teflufrin um, having short um, life on the seed coating due to the volatilization. So really this might be one of the last years we can have widespread use of force ST on the emus we currently have. 
And that's primarily due to the fact that it's based on the sugar beet registration, which means we're limited to 13 grams of active a hectare. Um, and when you think of the dose per seed rate, um, which the example here is going onions, but you can see we're over double that. So not only is that our first hurdle, but our second hurdle is that the force ST for sugar beet is a pelleted seed, and that is the stipulation on the label. So going forward, we'll have to do some work with CRD for both um, understanding if we can use it for seed coated, um, you know, film coated seed, as well as the, the, the rate that we can use in the field. As such, that'll be a big uh, area of focus for us going into 2021 for our trials. So that's the update on force. Now for things coming, so the product pipeline, there's a, there's a few things to be aware of. The first one is a new product uh, which will be on sale next year uh, in 2022, which is a Finto. So this is a flanicamid uh, product, so a Tepiki clone. So we'll have everything on the label that Tepiki has. Um, obviously for yourselves and carrots, not yet fully applicable, but obviously will be uh, of interest in the veg sector. The other thing that's coming is a completely new AI, Spiripidion. Um, some of you might have seen some news articles about it in uh, registration of this product elsewhere in the world. The UK is in scope, it's only recently become in scope, and we expect to have a registration, it says 2025 plus there, uh, it's probably going to be between 2025 and 2027. Now this active is similar to Spirotetramat, so it will be primarily targeting, targeting sucking pests, so aphids, white fly, etc. Uh, the registration will focus on the vegetables um, and we see it being very compatible with IPM strategies due to the fact that the work we've already conducted on it, um, it's very safe to beneficials. So good for the programme and it has a useful um, place in the programme controlling those difficult to uh, you know, resistant insects that have resistances to uh, other chemistry, this will be a good option. So as time goes on, we do some trials in the UK, we'll update you in the future. But focusing on products that we currently have, um, obviously the main one now is Minecto 1. Currently, we got this registered a few years ago, and you can see the list of um, different crop types, parsnips, carrots. Let me just put my pointer on. Carrots, parsnips, salsify, parsley root, horseradish and celeriac. So on label uh, for carrots, it is only carrot fly on the label. You can see we've got two applications of the 0.185 kilogram a hectare rate and seven days between applications and a seven day post harvest interval. Now the main thing to really uh, point out on the label is this stipulation around growth stage 19, uh, just to make that clear. So Minecto 1 is a diamide, so it's a new class of chemistry that's got an on label for this crop and just on the screen I have um, got Minecto 1 along with the different um, products you could be using in the veg sector. Just to give an idea what we have on label and then what we've actually found with it efficacy through um, incidental control we've seen in our field trials or what we've just experienced since launch uh, with what it can control. So with that I've obviously listed Minecto 1 in the left hand column against all the different pests we've had in trials and you can see anything in green in the Minecto 1 this is areas where we found that incidental control and how we perceive its efficacy so with three ticks we'd perceive excellent efficacy, two ticks we'd see moderate to good efficacy and then one tick low to moderate efficacy and then crosses where we don't see efficacy so uh, for the carrot sector, we have, and I'll get onto this later, we have seen very good efficacy with peach potato aphids. Um, so in, I'll come on to it later with a trial, we saw re good reductions in uh, virus transmission when Minecto was used in carrots. Um, the other thing, just to point out specifically for carrot willow aphid, this is something we haven't generated much data on yet, so I'll put a question mark. Um, it'll be using things like spirotetramat, et cetera, for willow carrot aphid because we haven't generated enough data to say what its efficacy like because I just want to say although we do see very good efficacy on certain aphid pests with Minecto 1 there's certain uh, types of aphids where we don't see any efficacy or variable efficacy it namely uh, Nasanobia the current lettuce aphids that we've seen uh, limited to no efficacy on controlling it with Minecto 1 and the black bean aphid uh, sometimes it controls the population 
relatively well. Other times we see very little efficacy in it. So with black bean aphids, it seems to be very dependent on what the population is. Um, but with current less data, we've not seen control. But however, for things specifically misers, which we're very interested in, it has very good control. And then for all the crops, um, all the pests we have on label, we see exceedingly good uh, control. For chewing pests, I think it is the product to use. And just a word on um, adjuvant use. So you might have seen on the previous slide, there was an asterisk this is next to the second pest. And this is because Monecto 1 being a WG formulation means unless certain crops have an adjuvant to allow penetration, and by adjuvant I mean a sort of high percent methylated rapeseed oil, such as phase 2, etc., it won't allow the active ingredient to get into the crop and then target the second pest by it ingesting it through um, its feeding habits. So most stark, obviously we're not talking about this today, most stark is brassicas where we would say if you want the incidental control of second pest from the Neto one on top of what you've targeted on your chewing pest, you wouldn't have to have a methylated rape seal uh, adjuvant in there to get that effect. For carrots, you can see there, it's advised. Um, in our trials, we've seen numerical improvements in marketable yields um, when using adjuvants, so there's no reason not to, but um, unlike the brassicas, it's not necessary to get the control you'd envisage when using the product, um, but if you can, we do see better coverage, penetration potentially, which allows better uh, control when using the product. Lettuce is one of the few ones where it's not necessary, uh, just because the, the leaf type, et cetera, means it can penetrate quite easily. So we don't really have, haven't yet seen a case where adjuvant has uh, necessarily increased the efficacy of nectar one. Things like peas, um, it's very much dependent on the season really. So it, the, if it's a hot season and we've got a waxier crop, then adjuvant, I would say, is becoming more and more necessary, but you can get good efficacy without. And alliums, it's advised again, mainly because it's the standard practice um, but we also get better penetration into the crown for controlling thrips. But for carrots, I would say um, it can improve efficacy, but it's not um, hugely significant when we've had it in trials, the benefits. So it's up to um, your discretion. But just to show it is a step change over using pyrethroids. The other thing I did mention while talking about willow carrot aphid, um, the other thing about willow carrot aphid, just everyone's aware that uh, we know there is pyrethroid resistance in the willow carrot population and primarily driven by the fact that we are widely using pyrethroids to control the carrot fly. So that's just a, um, a warning there while I'm talking through these slides, but obviously all of the slides I'm going to show now on results is targeted towards carrot fly. So we did some work in 2018 with Warwick um, looking at sort of programs with Hallmark or Minecto one in the program for carrot fly control and you can see sort of undamaged percent roots here. So we had about 70% damage in the untreated, had you know significant increase in uh, reduction in damage when you use pyrethroid programs. But when Monecto one's used, Scientron and probably Actima is exceedingly good at controlling the carrot fly. So it offers a, you know, a significant step change up and above uh, a pyrethroid program. We've also got some data from VCS showing this. Also in this uh, trial, we had uh, chlorantrinoprol. So this is a first generation diamide, um, corrigin, uh, et cetera, compared to Minecto one second generation diamide, uh, where with cyantrinoprol, we've seen increased efficacy of chlorantrinoprol as well as that wider um, target host uh, pest range as well. But you can see this is the opposite to the other chart where we've got um, percent damage. So we've got severe in light pink, we've got purple being moderate damage and then minor damage in the darker pink there. And you can see again on all categories, majority we've got Minecto one being a step change, not only of the pyrethroid, but the, the chlorantrinoprol as well. So really are seeing very good efficacy with this on the label pests. Now, just uh, to show what we've seen in the UK, so this was done a few years ago, the BCGA demo site um, and we, a few caveats, it, is, it was just a demo. Uh, we have tried to do a few more trials with Minecto one looking primarily at virus control. However, the trials I've been conducting have not had um, any virus to make inferences from what the programs did. So unfortunately, one of the best things we had visually 
to show is a, a demo site where we're looking at different insecticide programs. And as you can see here, I've, I've numbered the treatments one to six, untreated on the far right hand side. And I've just shown what the viral percentage in that plot was. And then we've got obviously what was cruise at that point, reducing it way down, putting a uh, insecticidal program with spirotechmat, biotopia and spirotechmat over the top, reducing it further again, removing the cruiser in plot four, and you can see it might be a slight bit more yellow in those plots, but again, um, a far reduction of the untreated, and then replacing that first spirotechmat with a minute to one. Um, you can see that actually had the lowest virus level uh, along with the um, a force treated Netto one program. So caveat it is just a um, demo, but this these spray timings were aligning directly when a large Mises migration happened. There was with a carrot aphid on the site, but the application timing, especially with the Netto one, was timed exactly when the Mises was coming in. So we saw good control with these programs, uh, which Minecto was part of. So that's just my piece around Minecto one for the season to make sure that um, everyone's fully aware of the incidental control you can get with Minecto one to then adjust where you might have in the program to get best use of getting the carrot fly control, but potentially also reducing virus in carrots. So moving on to um, sort of what we've been doing on the sustainability side, looking at pest management, um, myself and Belinda Bailey, our sustainable farming manager, have been doing a project for the last couple of years looking at a green headland mix. And this was specifically designed for carrot, potato, onion fields, any veg um, fields that are grown that would have potentially bare headlands. Um, the inception of the idea was first initially around um, soil improvement, soil retention on the, on the farm. Um, but has grown since that point where we have been looking for the last few years at it as a um, IPM uh, scenario where we're propagating beneficial insects, potentially acting as a viral sponge before aphids go into the field and it being part of what could be seen as an IPM program. Uh, you can see some details on screen about the offer. So it's a subsidise, we subsidise it for Operation Pollinator. It's half price at £35 a hectare for a pack pack is 20 kilos and you can plant it anywhere between end of April to June. I probably would leave it till May um, just so that the soil is a bit warmer and it gets going. This is a very light cultivation if any and just roll because of the, the what's in the mixes and there's two now. Um, in the main mix we've got all radish, phacelia, common vetch, bursting clover and buckwheat and then we've got a non-brassica mix. Uh, so we take out the all radish and replace it with crimson clover and linseed. Uh, this project has been in conjunction with Asda and IPL and initially it was with the IPL growers but now is a, is a wide offer so this, is a, this offer is available to everyone. But just to show what we were initially looking at doing and this was done in the east um, as you can see around the Brackland area very sandy soils but still exceedingly flat and this is it, uh, around carrot fields. Um, fields right next door to each other but this direction was um, photos obviously without the headland mix and we've having, especially with irrigation, if you have irrigation around certain crops, it's having an effect, if you look on the right hand side, reducing the runoff, making the soil drier and increasing uh, permeability. We've had a lot of information from the growers. We've had six in a sort of project for the last couple of years saying that, you know, the headlands are improved, the friability is better. Um, so we have done what the first aim of the project was, which is allow the soils on headlands to be retained because they're not getting that runoff. You know, the rooting systems we have on this, uh, especially with the all radish having that big penetrating root, but the variety of different types of root really hold the soil down well, and we do get those soil improvements. And just to show it, it can be traveled on. So obviously exactly where the wheelings are, you'll have loss of crop. But apart from that, um, it is very resilient to being traveled on, moving irrigators over, etc. Um, and I've got some work later on in this talk to talk around about it in infield use and buffers so even when we you know the main thing with this is just herbicide use make sure that you use um, low drift nozzles uh, drift time if you can to make sure that applications and fields stay in field is really the only sort of advice that needs to be done around this other than that if you want to control um, or prolong flowering you can top it halfway through flowering and that will stop it going to seed and continue flowering for a few more months um, and then destructions up to the grower. We've had a lot of growers who have just left it to go to seed, to so the sort of seed mix over winter for birds. Um, but if you do not want that, you can spray it off or 
uh, plough it in, uh, it is up to the discretion of what the grower would like with this, because this is an annual mix. It's not really for um, having it as a long-term headland. It's for the rotation of that crop. But just to show some information that we've gathered from, you know, the first part, looking at it, soil improvement and what it does for biomass on, this, on the different sites we've had, you can see a, a snapshot of that with three locations. And what we did was take a one meter cut down of the um, headland. So this is everything above soil exactly one square meter. So we can work out what benefit it is having on farm. So you can see a bit of information in bold about the locations and then what the, each of these different locations, all these were through all different areas in East Anglia. You can see the top um, yielding green headland was about 36 tonnes a hectare of green matter, around 90% of that being dry matter. So it is making a lot of biomass that will go feed back into the soil to increase structure, let alone the roots that we've put there as well. The other thing to note is the amount of N, P and K that we've um, generated. So this is about 200 pounds worth of Per hectare worth of nutrient capture and creation because obviously we've got the leguminous elements in there producing that extra nitrogen. Uh, we also did some work this year with the Game Wildlife Conservation Trust. They found that they were always producing, no matter where they had it, uh, around over 20 tonnes a hectare, so very similar to the numbers we were seeing here. I think the top um, yielder this year was 40 tonnes a hectare for the brassica mix, just to be clear. Um, on the higher scale of the biomass. Um, but they were also finding that the, the green headland mix was capturing about 50% of the soil mineral nitrogen. So it's doing a good job of, of, of that, which is really good to hear. Uh, we also found that, um, especially if you're in areas which you've got heavier soil, um, obviously maybe not for the, so much for the carrots, but overall it can help um, remove moisture. So they're about 30% drier, uh, the headland. So we're, you know, that could potentially be good for your system as well. So we've had very good soil benefits. But what the project's been focused on more for the last couple of years is the biodiversity that brings this floristic margin to the farm. Um, and then following on from that, what can that be as a benefit to the grower? So just a summary of, of the last sort of couple of years of work, 2016 to 2018, of on the left-hand side, if you looked at the, the individuals uh, in that collection for each of those years, what percentage of those fall into the beetles, bugs, obviously what we're more maybe interested in, the bees, butterflies, spiders, hoverflies and lace wings for individuals, and what's the species makeup? So you can see, yes, very heavily uh, slanted towards the beetles and bugs, um, but you can see for species diversity, we have a very large proportion of what we might want to be enriching, which is lacking that floristic margin in the environment. So it's doing a good job. And just to note, these uh, assessments uh, were done on, I don't know, about, depending on the year, between 20 and 40,000 individuals. So poorly, uh, um, ecologist who does the sweet nesting, he does it sort of from June to August, um, a few times at each site, does a lot of work to find out what's going on in these. Um, the other things to note, in all the uh, results we've had so far, we've not been finding carrot fly um, in these mix. And you probably wouldn't expect it because we don't have umbellifers, uh, so there wouldn't be that attraction. Also, the aphids, we've not found those in the sweet netting. The only time I've really been seeing aphids in the mix is late into the autumn if the mix is left to keep on going and we see some mealy cabbage aphid go on the brassicas in the mix. So obviously, going to the non-brassica mix, uh, you wouldn't have that either. But just to talk about what we did last year, because we started doing uh, some different things last year, you can see we weren't quite to the same levels of we collection in previous years. We only did about nine and a half thousand individuals collected. But you can see again, the skew is very much similar to previous years, bugs and beetles, and then looking at flies and uh, other species and making up the, the, the individuals and the species diversity again, very similar to what we've had previously. But the reason we did a slightly different this year, because we were trying to look at how the green headland mix compares to what would be a long-term habitat. So just say if you had a grass margin, what's, what's the difference? Um, so you can see here, we've split up all those individuals if they were found in the green headland or if they found in the grass margin on the different sites. So you can see we did those six sites again. And you can see the amount of species in, uh, in, in blue there, the dots, total number of specimens. And yes, because it's not a long-term habitat, we potentially have a uh, lower uh, number of you know, species diversity, 
but what we do have is a doubling of the specimens and, and what we're creating with these short-term annual mixes is a, a, a short-term temporary habitat so which has a lot of food sources for the pollinators and, and nectar driven uh, species so it, although maybe it hasn't got the wide total species as a long-term habitat we're bringing a lot of insects in short term to give them that food and energy source because this is definitely an enrichment of the environment so this is the kind of results we wanted to see actually from a short-term uh, project like this. The other thing is we can break it down into um, what sort of species they were in the two mixes. So you can see that again in the grass margin, we're much higher towards the margin, uh, sorry, towards the beetles and the bugs. Now this supports other work carried out um, in the industry. Any sort of monocot uh, rich area tends to lean towards these types of species. But you can see the hoverflies and pollen and nectar loving insects are more likely to be in the headland because of the pollinators there. The other thing we've been looking at now is that sort of idea around can we use this as a sort of um, eye chemistry actually enriching beneficial insects. So you can see on the right hand side of the dotted line we sort of split them up into are they herbivores, pollinators or predators. So herbivores you could potentially see as uh, pests. Generally the pests we find in the in the margins are very minor uh, you know plant bugs etc so not nothing too serious but generally we have with the green headland mix we always seem to have roughly around about a three to one ratio of pests to predators so initially you say okay well three times the amount of pests to predators sounds like a bad proportion but actually that's incredibly good and high for the predator side because you have to imagine each predator species can eat up to 120 pests per individual the reason that it can be sustained is due to the fact we do have a lot of generous insects there's other things uh, in the mix because of the diversity there uh, allowing those predators to um, propagate and when we've been doing the results ladybirds and especially late swings and hoverflies I think hoverflies have been a big part of what we've been attracting on the predator size for these mixes so there's the potential there we can have this beneficial effect and just to show this very much is an enrichment of your local ecology. It's nothing to do with the crop. Um, I've just split up what we've looked at, you know, these headlands around carrots, onions, parsnips, potatoes. Obviously you can see the number of margins studied. When we started it was a big skew towards potatoes, but generally if you look at the sort of individuals or species, mean, um, min, max of each thing, Generally, it's not too dissimilar from each other. Um, what it really is much more when we look at the data itself, the farm's location, the surrounding ecology, land use is much more affected uh, on what species you attract into the headland, as you might imagine. So you're enriching what's already there. You can't necessarily change it. To change something like this, you would need two to 5% of your land use in a scheme of some form, enriching the environment to have a very long-term effect and that would have to be year on year. So all this can do is have a short-term benefit to your local ecology and increase the biodiversity. Uh, through this, obviously, we've also been finding a lot of rare notable species, especially on the pollinator side, and those are all being reported into the census. But in 2018, that was when we started to look at can this act as a as a viral filter. One, if it, you know, we know that aphids generally will be coming into a field from the headland and moving in. So if they're moving through the headland because we don't have any of the species that might cause propagation of certain viruses, does it act as a, a viral filter if they're non-persistent? So enough time for the aphid to move through, lose the virus when it started and then get to the field so they're inert in a way. Or the beneficial propagation, does that have an effect of reducing the aphid pressure? Uh, particularly, that was what we were concerned about. So 2018, we did a um, study in carrots where we were doing a hectare in the field without a headland, a hectare study in a feel with the headland, making notes of some where the location of beneficials were found. Um, and it was very notable the amount of beneficials and penetration we're getting in the field with the headland compared to the one we didn't have. And then when we came to look at the virus itself, we did have a 70% reduction in uh, viral symptoms in that year. However, the caveat was a very low viral symptom year. So pinch of salt on that, but all our data suggests it's definitely not what some people are concerned with is causing a larger problem than having just a bare headland. Um, and just visually here, you can see uh, the biomass we were getting in the headlands itself, um, five metres into the field that had the headland, 
five meters into a field that didn't have the head. And then there was a, you know, this was a consistent trend that we were always having more biodiversity or more biomass of insect life. And as we said previously, not bad but, uh, pests or disease coming in. What it is is just propagating a more diverse um, species, which is going to be beneficial, reducing large population explosions of aphids potentially. So this initial finding was very good. Then in 2019, I really want to see how far can we get penetration from maybe beneficials we're finding in the headland into the field themselves. So we were setting up traps in the headland, 25 metres, 50 metres, 75 metres and 100 metres into the field. Uh, and you can see I split out the species we were finding in the traps into pollinators in green, pests in blue, predators in red and just generous non-specific species in um, purple there. And it is quite stark as soon as you get relatively you know, far into the field, we just have a massive drop off, you know, 90% reduction in, in species and biomass as soon as we get into the field. So if we're seeing this as an in-field effect that we want to have, you probably will have to have this on more or less every um, tram line or have a myth bed between booms, etc., to have this in-field penetration. And just a visual of that you can see um, here what the level of biomass we're collecting in the headland itself and then into the field how it drops off and most of the uh, stuff in the traps themselves is actually just groundsel seed because there's a groundsel uh, issue in the field rather than insect life so it just is a visual to show the start drop off so if this is going to be an infield approach it very much has to be very uh, consistent and quite close together in the field so to start understanding if it, that could work uh, we did something in the 2019 BCGA open day, where you can see here in the drone image uh, where we had a couple of beds of the green headland mix surrounding a carrot bed. And we were trying to see if we can get the same benefit to the carrots for uh, virus control or just pest control than we could with a insect side trial, which was next door. So you can see the layout here from above. Also, we were trying to um, maybe enhance it a bit by introducing predators as such as lace wings, parasitic wasps and ladybirds. But that was the idea of the trial. However, we might be uh, a bit optimistic with the results we could get because obviously we were going to the centre of a standard trial uh, field which had a very good insecticide treatment over the rest of it. So the virus level was very low, but overall again we weren't seeing any dramatic decreases in um, what might be a worry for some introducing pests that wouldn't have been there because of the headland mix. So overall, very positive. Um, the only difference was because we weren't doing the insecticide applications, we were missing some of the micronutrients we would have put on. So that was the only difference visually for the carrot crop itself. So the thing we did last year sort of progress this again was, okay, we've done trials now, can we do it on an in-field scenario? So. The caveat for yourselves, this is potatoes, um, but this was seed potatoes up in Scotland just to see if this could be an effective way. Uh, and, and logistics wise, it, can it be done? So Eric Anderson, we gave him the brassica and non brassica mix, and you can see the pictures here. It was done uh, in mist beds and up the tram line through a field so that it was very consistent. As you can see through the field, it was about 36 metres, I think. So Eric did this for us and you know it worked very well through the season. Um, as long as they use the right nozzles, you can see this went right through the season and then had herbicide passes and everything, and we didn't have any effect on the headland mix going through the field. So it is possible to have as an infield approach. And just some data from Eric showing uh, just numbers of invertebrates we were finding in the, the brassica headland mix versus its control and the non brassica headland mix versus its control. So again, we are having that increased biomass uh, because we are a food source so that will bring in more individuals. So that was just sort of uh, an overview of what we're doing for the last few years to show that we can use this green headland mix as initially wanted to reduce runoff uh, even in very flat locations especially if there's light soil it works very well uh, as well as if there's irrigation involved and that will have a direct benefit to the ground one for the soil but also the nutrient capture is really um, palpable there, 200 pounds worth, um, good capture of the soil mineral nitrogen as well. And then we have been doing a lot of work which all shows there's never been a detriment to um, the crops and you know work looking at that infield solution is going to progress. For aphids the majority of control will likely be from the um, margins anyway because of flights and how they land in the field but could be of interest going forward so 
as we get more data on that, we do plan to do some more work this year. We'll report that back. But that's uh, everything from me, and thank you for your attention. And with that, I'll pass back to Rebecca to do the questions. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Max. You can just stop sharing your screen for me then. Hopefully all three of us, perfect, will appear. Um, so we've had a few questions come in, but by all means, um, if you can type them into the, the Q&A box, we'll try and try and get through those. So the first one up is, um, do you have any indication of what rate reduction of lambda could be expected in carrots and parsnips? Do you want to take that or shall I? I'll leave that to you, Rebecca. Thanks. Um, so obviously when we submitted the data package to CRD, um, there is the, the new gap, the good agricultural practice that's been submitted in there. Um, with our suggestions to, to CRD. Personally, I wouldn't like to comment on what those are at the minute because experience dictates that what you put in isn't always necessarily what you get out. Um, so I kind of wouldn't want to sit here and say it's going to be X and Y and when it actually comes out of CRD, it's something completely different. So um, we'll, we'll wait on that, I'm afraid, at the minute, at the minute Ian. Um, another question for you, Max. Um, how would you recommend establishing the green headland mix? Does it require drilling or could it be spread on and lightly incorporated slash rolled in? Yeah, so to be honest, Ian, I'd, I'd prefer the latter. Um, really just scattered over the top and rolled in. And that's primarily because of the clover in it. It um, doesn't like to be drilled deep. If you are drilling, I would do it as, as shallow as you possibly can, to be honest, and then roll over. Uh, just needs consolidation between it and the, the seabed, and that will do it fine. Um, in, in our recommendations, uh, we do say you can put 30 kilos of N on to start it up. However, from experiences, because, you know, we're really doing probably, you know, ab we ideally want about six metres um, of this to be beneficial. Um, that's probably going to get most of it and enough of its nitrogen from field applications, to be honest, or what you're doing in field or previous practices. But it, it's there just in case, uh, you know, it's a bit poor or sore and you do want it to start off well. So that's how I would do it. Thank you. Uh, and I think you, you pretty much answered this one, um, but I'll just mention it in case there is anything further to add of, um, of the distances that predators migrate from green margin into the, into the carrot crop. Yeah, so with the data we showed, it, it's it's very, you know, we were finding them all the way with into 100 metres into the crop from what we're doing, but it was, you know, 90% less than we were finding near the headland. So that drop off is incredibly rapid. And to be fair, that's not surprising because if there's not necessarily a food source for them to go to into the crop, especially if you've done a good job with uh, insecticide programmes, there's not much call for them to be there. So if you have the headland mix um, through the field, there's a potential that they might go that you know just away from it a little bit more rapidly you know from five to 25 meters i think that's a big drop off just there but five meters they'll be going in to scavenge and have a look around but it, it's it's very much the concentration will stay in the headland where the food source is brilliant thank you max um another question here how do we manage the growth stage restriction um growth stage 19 for minecto one in carrots um well, by manage, you, you follow it. And this is all around uh, ground intersection. Um, we know it's a pain point and we have, myself and Rebecca have inquired about it, but the likelihood if we do any work on it, it's not going to get better. Is the sort of outcome from that. So it's it's about stewardship, you know, using it well and, you know, is a new chemistry. And I know there's frustration about the, the label when we have those two, but that is the, the label to follow. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Okay. Well, I think, let me just check all the tabs. I think we've answered all of the, oh, no, hang on. Um, people are typing quickly now. Is the use of pollination strips more placed for organics? With the insecticide use in conventional crops, will the potential benefits be reduced? Um, Yes, uh, they definitely will be. I mean, the, the, one of the future projects me and myself and Belinda Bailey are interested in doing is a, working with the likes of um, 
ADAS and other groups like that to establish beneficial pest threshold. Um, so it can be a more targeted approach rather than what this is advocating, which is a more of an IPM strategy where you're using everything and it hopefully will have a benefit. Um, as you say, if there's insecticide use, you're going to be using that, so that will reduce them. The idea with this is that you're, you're enriching the environment, then you might get a side benefit um, with this. And that's where we're going for. In the future, we're hoping to be more targeted so you can then say how many beneficials to how many pests you have and work out where you are in the population dynamics to give you a bit better understanding of when to spray and when not to spray. We're not quite at that point yet, but I have a very strong feeling and, and want for that to become uh, more of use in non-organic situations as in standard practice on farm. Brilliant, thank you, Max. Um, another lambda one. So there's been some discussion about lambda used in furrow on other crops. Is there an opportunity or potential for this in carrots to help um, counteract the loss of force? So, yes, Ian, we have got some granule type formulations coming through the pipeline um, and they are uh, looking as options if we cannot alleviate the issues with force, they will be explored as well. So that is in the total, um, you know, project we're looking at around this issue. So yes, we are uh, investigating that. Yeah, we're kind of doing this work in tandem where we're, we're trying to fix the force issue, um, but we're also looking at other options at the same time if it's not fixable. Yes. yes. So I think that, well, that's all the questions that we have in um, the Q&A box. I'm just scrolling up quickly to make sure. Yep, that's all of those. So all that leaves me to do is thank you both very much um, for your input today. Thank you everyone um, who's on the line for, for joining in. I hope you found this event um, useful and enjoyable. A reminder that, is that you'll receive an email tomorrow um, if you wish to claim your basis and Neuroso points. Hopefully you're familiar with how to do that by now with all the webinars that are happening. Um, and you'll also receive a, a link to a, a survey that we would be very grateful if you could just answer the half a dozen questions um, so we can see what kind of things you guys want to hear about in the future um, and all of that. So without further ado, thank you both. I hope you all have a good day and um, hope to see you in person soon. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much, everybody. Cheers.